everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the Zoom launch for A Grave Diagnosis, 35 Stories of Murder and Malaise, and it is a Carrick Publishing crime anthology. I'm glad to see everybody here. We've got a really nice full house and it's just terrific. So I hope that you enjoy meeting so many of our authors. We've got a terrific author turnout. I'm going to run through the author names and the names of their stories before we begin. First of all, we've got Catherine Astolfo, who is the author of The Backpack. We've got Rosemary O'Bear, Mercy. We've got uh, Jane Barnard, The Christmas Rose. Tom Bennett, The Empty Grave, The Bridge Case by Susan Bowman, Unmasked by Jane Peterson Burfield, The Referral by Linda Cahill, The Eternal Baker of the Factual Mind by M.H. Calway. Hi, Madeline. Hi. <laughs> Two Crooks Walk Into a Store by Melody Campbell, and I know Melody is here. A Grave Diagnosis by yours truly, Donna Carrick. The Drowning by Rosalind Croucher, and just uh, full disclosure, Rosalind is my sister. I have a, a lot of family here today. Um, we've got two Rosalinds, but that one is my sister. Love Thy Neighbor by Lisa DeNicolitz, and that's a really delightful story, Lisa. The Rocking R by John M. Floyd, and when you guys get to read it, I think you're going to really like that one. Aura by Mary Fraser, really creepy. <laughs> Sorry for the commentary. I better cut out the commentary or we'll never get through the introductions. <laughs> the Neighborhood Watch by Deli Fromm. Boomtown Shakedown by Therese Greenwood. A Pill a Day Keeps the Blues Away by Elizabeth Mosang. Sleep, Perchance to Die by Blair Keach. Change of Heart by Laura Coleman. The Crimson Grave by Haley Liversidge. Days Without Name by Sylvia Maltash Warsh, The Red Cord by Rob McCartney, Hooked by Rosemary McCracken, and Rosemary, a huge, huge thank you. And that is for the copy edit work that you did, which was exceptional. Thank you so much. Woman Aglow by Lynn Murphy, Napoleon's Nose by Joan O'Callaghan. That's a very clever one. Danny and Me by Ed Pivowarczyk, again creepy. Criminals Like Us by Rosalind Place. In His Element by Marilee Robson. The House of Elizabeth Dandridge by C.A. Rowland. Hi, Carolyn. Sometimes Miracles Happen by Steve Schrott. Crossmatch by Madonna Scaff. Waiting in the Wings by Caro Souls. The Poison Pill Cure by Blake Sterling. Hypochondriacs Never Get This by Kevin P. Thornton. And you can just imagine all of you who know Kevin. Medicine by Vanessa Westerman. And this is a fabulous, fabulous trail of stories. Um, I'm gonna try and go around the room and just ask some questions to our authors so you can get to know them. And Catherine, you might wanna unmute because you're first on my list today. You've written the backpack which is a really, really clever story about a woman who's come upon some real bad misfortune and has found a way to deal with it um, extensively. And anyone who's read Catherine Astolfo's work will know how diabolical it can get. So tell us a little bit about your inspiration for The Backpack. Well, it's probably sounds kind of weird, but it was inspired by a backpack but uh, <laughs> it was, um, there was an abandoned backpack on our gate. I, I, I live in a condo uh, corporation um, and uh, the, the backpack was there for the longest time. And there's a couple of schools around, so it's, it wasn't unusual or anything, but it, the unusual part was that it stayed there and stayed there and you know days went by and no one picked it up. So I thought that was odd. And of course, then my brain starts, you know, thinking of what if, what, what if something was found in there that was incriminating? What if there's a severed hand in there? I mean, you know, all those crazy things that crime writers think about all the time. And uh, anyway, then when I started writing the story, all I had was the title, the backpack. And somehow the story morphed and changed and became something 
really completely different from what I thought it would be about. And I think part of it was, you know, because of the pandemic, it became kind of a story about if you're for whatever reason isolated and you start thinking about all the people around you or looking out the window at all the people around you. So it's a, it's different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is a COVID anthology. This is how we spent our COVID lockdown, really. I mean, we could all just write a book report about how we spent our COVID lockdown. So you're right. I think the stories did take on that tinge. All of the ones I've read, even the ones that weren't about COVID, um, and a lot of them were not, thank, thank God they were not all. <laughs> Um, but they had that tinge to them, that tinge of isolation and desperation almost. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's a really great story, Kathy. I, I have to tell you, if you haven't read Catherine Astolfo, please look for her work. Um, is Rosemary Bear here? I believe you yeah, are, yeah, Rosemary. Can. can you hear me? I certainly can. I Good. certainly can. <laughs> You've got a story titled Mercy. And it's a very poignant story, which is a kind of your element anyway. Um, things I've read by you have been rather poignant. And um, can you tell us a little bit about Mercy? Have you known anyone like her? Have you, um, you know? I probably have known a number of people like her. But what happened with this particular story is that I couldn't think of an idea. I couldn't think of an idea at all. And then I was watching the news again, and I saw a window, and I saw a person behind the window, and I thought, I've got to write about this. And um, I, uh, the story came very quickly, and it's not very long. Most of my stories are longer than this. Yes. But I thought, um, you know, my overwhelming feeling with COVID is there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, I just feel so helpless. Mm -hmm. But with this story, I felt that this particular character did do something about it, even though it was something unconscionable. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, something was done about it. And in a way, because of the circumstances, the heroine of the story gave up her own life to assist um, the quick passage of an, another person. So I felt that it was a story, it was a story about mercy. Anyway, um, it makes me sad even to think of this story because I know that it's so close to being true. Yes, 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 it really was. And that's why I say it was so poignant. And, um, you know, I just, I felt like you were writing about somebody you knew. That's why I asked it that way, you know? It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have we got, uh, we, I know we don't have Jane Barnard in the room, but I want to just mention her story, Christmas Rose, because it's a fun one. Well, I guess it's not fun to, to Rose, <laughs> because uh, things do not go well for her. But you're going to want to look for, for Christmas Rose by Jane Barnard when it does go live. Uh, it's just a great story. I know we've got Tom Bennett here. I saw you come in, Tom. I want to ask you a little bit about your cast Gentry character. How did he come to you? Well, cast Gentry um, came to me slowly, actually. Um, I, I conceived the idea of the novel to begin with, my first novel, the first cast entry novel, which is The Death Merchants. Uh, and uh, his character built up, went through several metamorphoses uh, in, in time. Um, as it turned out, uh, cast Gentry was born on uh, April the uh, 13th, uh, 1928. So in his first novel, uh, he'd be 31 years old. Uh, Cass uh, was born uh, into a uh, upper middle class family. His father was a rich industrialist uh, in a, uh, a small uh, Southern Ontario city. Uh, and um, his mother, uh, Margaret or Maggie, as it were, uh, she features in his novels. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, he decided that he was going to become a private detective. So he stayed in Greenwich Village, uh, only about a block or so from Washington Square. Excellent. And uh, these, I think of them as um, almost noir novels, but you had another word for them when we spoke before. Um, 
how would you classify these novels? And Cass Gentry is featured, by the way, in The Empty Grave, which is a story in a grave diagnosis. But how would you classify these novels, Tom, if you had to just put one word on them? Well, uh, they started off as mysteries, but they sort of uh, ended up as, uh, as thrillers. Um, the second one is uh, the sequel, uh, which takes place uh, almost immediately after the first one in the, uh, in the late fall of 1959. And it's called the uh, the man with Hemingway's face, uh, and he gets associated with uh, some mobsters um, in the first novel, and he's uh, doing uh, ends up doing a job uh, for the for the uh, for the mobster Frank Palladino. They're, they're great titles too, Tom. I really appreciate them. Um, I don't think we have Susan Bowman, but I know that we've got Jane Peterson Burfield. And Jane has written another one of her delightfully poisonous stories um, titled Unmasked. And uh, yes, there is a COVID element. Jane, if you're there, please tell us what made you come up with this killer. It was, uh, it was an interesting process. I was writing it back uh, for a long time. I, I, it, was, it was hard to sort of get it out. But I figured COVID would be well over by now, and we should have some way of remembering some of the little ticks that COVID brought on. And here we are, sort of right in the middle of the second wave. Um, it, it was interesting. Uh, I wanted to do it from the point of view of a of a nurse. Uh, she and her husband are isolated at home when she gets home from her job, and uh, secrets are revealed, and and she becomes. Uh, it, it just brings their relationship to uh, to a point. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it does. Secrets are revealed. That's a really good way of saying it, Jane. Thank you. Secrets are revealed and a victory takes place. Um, next on our list, we've got the referral by Linda Cahill. Is Linda here in the house? Thank you. And Linda's written a diabolical, another diabolical story. This one is about a surgeon who, frankly, has to go down. His name might as well be Earl because Earl's got to die. <laughs> Linda, can you tell us how what made you come up with such a diabolical story? Um, the story, uh, the story basically has to do with doesn't have to do with COVID exactly, but when you're sitting there in COVID and you can't do anything, you start thinking about power imbalances, and it struck me that the power imbalance between the surgeon and the patient could be pretty bad. So I decided to play with that and uh, introduce some concepts that I think work pretty well. And, I, and um, it doesn't go as well for the surgeon as he imagines. No, it doesn't go as well for him. And otherwise, <laughs> the story goes very well. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank you. And uh, now we've got a, a really... A really odd duck of a story. That's how I'm going to call this one. And it's really worth reading. It's a bit of a fantasy. It's called The Eternal Bakery of the Factal Mind by M.H. Calway, Madeline. Um, Madeline, this is a little off your beaten path. Can you tell me what brought you to this story? What made you want to tell this story? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Donna. It, it's, um, it's a bit of a departure for me. My husband's a, a big speculative uh, fiction reader and uh, I've never really I dabble in it sometimes but I've never actually written anything but I got this idea when I was in Vancouver for the left coast crime conference and uh, I went for a walk I wanted to see my old apartment building where I, I, I was a student at UBC and it was there and as we, uh, we were walking back uh, there was the bakery where I ate breakfast every day and the same thing happened when I went to Victoria to see my sister-in-law and there was a bakery. I'd also, I worked in Victoria for a while and there was a bakery where I used to eat breakfast every day. And I started to put things together. Like what if a bakery was constant in time and space and the story kind of grew from there. And it, it is really, it's really good. Like I, I love the way that the bakery is like the portal through time and space, as you say, it's, it's, um, and it's got a poignancy to it too. I mean, there's more to the story than just the time travel. There's yeah, a I, love, I love ambiguity. I love ambiguity in stories. And the story is really, it's about Alzheimer's because uh, um, yeah, I had to deal with Alzheimer's quite a bit with my uh, 
elderly father-in-law. And so that's kind of, that's the disease element of the story. Mm -hmm. So, and also an ambiguity, like we don't know whether our protagonist is really experiencing what he experiences or not, but that's really for the reader to decide. Yeah. As he goes through the portal and has quite a few adventures, I might add. So mm -hmm. it's not reflective. It's a bit of a thriller as well. My husband, Alec, has a saying, we might as well have some fun while we go nuts. I think he has <laughs> I agree. some adventure while he's using his capacities. <laughs> I agree, I agree. <laughs> um, next on the list, we've got Melody Campbell, our own really funny lady. Thank you for joining us, Melody. Melody's got a story that is not a long one, but it really does capture the fun side of this. It's called Two Crooks Walk Into a Store. And uh, Melody, let me ask you to tell about it. About the inspiration for that one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, some of you know I used to be a bank manager, which is really rather hilarious when you think of it, uh, considering I write about a mob goddaughter. Uh, in this particular story, I went back to my roots. Usually in my short stories, I go serious because in my books, I, I go loopy. Um, but in this case, I decided to go funny again. And the inspiration was when I was a bank manager, we had a bank robbery foiled by an absolutely hilarious little Portuguese woman with one of those leather handbags that had the brass uh, the little brass corners on it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. someone was trying to rob the bank and he bit he butted in line in front of this is mrs Pereira, and she got so mad she just started yelling in portuguese and and swashing her bag on his head and mm -hmm. i thought someday i'm going to use that in a story but in a very very different way and i kind of reversed it as you know donna yes yes i'm not going to give too much away because it's not a long story when you all get your hands on it you're going to want to read it but the the thing that struck me most about it melody is there's some great physical comedy in it i mean you really packed some does that go back to your time as a stand-up yes it does yeah um on stage you have to be pretty active and mm -hmm. I, did do so, I, I mainly wrote stand-up for other comedians but I did do some myself and I still as you know Donna I still do some for uh, conferences uh, mm -hmm. when I don't like a liquored up crowd that, that's no. not for me so, no. No. so usually I'll open a conference and mm -hmm. uh, and then there's always a little bit of physical comedy in there so mm -hmm. I like to include that when I was reading your story, Two Crooks Walk Into a Store, I was remembering something Lucille Ball once said. You've got to be prepared to throw yourself at the coffee table so hard it breaks, but you have to bounce. You know? <laughs> That's kind of a secret to physical for comedy. women in comedy, we're, we're, um, we survive by being self-deprecating. Uh, Mm -hmm. really, and, and Lucille Ball was, was the master at that. So was Phyllis Diller. I, I wrote mm -hmm. a little for Phyllis Diller. And I think Stephen Trott, he should be on here. And I know he wrote for Phyllis too. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if Stephen entered the room. Did he enter it? Do you know? Um, I hope he has, because he's definitely on our list today. The next one is actually one of mine. And Madeline, I think you had a couple questions. Let me take advantage of you. There now. we are. Yeah, I, I was going to take advantage too to ask you a little bit more about our, our anthology as a whole. And um, and that was, this is, you've published dozens of anthologies through Garrick mm -hmm. and including uh, four of the Maydams anthologies and three uh, crime anthologies and several collections by, I think, some of, of authors here today. Yes, yes, and that's that, right. Yeah, so and I never missed a deadline until this one. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why did you decide to pick the, how did it come about that we had this topic? Because it was actually pre-COVID. Oh, yes, yes. Well, this story is a true story. I was actually having lunch with Madeline and Madeline asked, would I do an anthology for Carrick Publishing this year? And I said, oh, I don't know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> I whined and I hummed and I hawed. And then I said, but if I did, I've got a couple of themes that we could uh, choose from. I can't remember what the other one was, but I had one other that I threw out. And then I also said, or illness. I think I just remembered what the other one was, but I'm not going to mention it because we may use it in a future anthology. Yes. Um, 
And so illness is the one that uh, we decided to go with. So every story in the anthology features a crime and a, an actual illness. It must be an actual legitimate illness recognized by the medical society. And every single story does feature one. And uh, then COVID hit. And yeah. I, you know, you can't laugh or, or belittle because so many people have died and there's been so much suffering and there's been financial stresses and all these things. But my little selfish authorly publisher mind was thinking, oh God, people are going to think I'm, you know, just like the, the I, I'm the eagle of death or something or some kind of vulture <laughs> now just taking advantage of COVID with this thing. But I already had stories and I, you know, I couldn't turn back the clock and change the theme because I would have had to send back all the stories. So here we are. This is how we came up with illness as our theme in the year of COVID. Right. And so tell us about your own story. Oh, my own story is titled, I have to remind myself now, it's titled, uh, where am I? A Grave Diagnosis. <laughs> so it's the title story. And in it, um, a doctor, a doctor encounters the parent of a patient and it's somebody that she knows from her past. And he doesn't recognize her because in the hospital, all medical workers are covered to the gills. They're wearing masks, they're wearing visors, they're wearing headgear and gloves. So he doesn't recognize her. Plus she has her married name on her name tag. He is in the hospital in emergency with his daughter who is sick. So she recognizes him, he doesn't recognize her. So now we get a little of the backstory of how she knows him and, uh, what has transpired and why his daughter is sick. And without giving too much away, he was a former uh, boyfriend of hers who is now married and uh, is trying to get out of an unhappy marriage. And I'll leave it there because to say any more will give away too much. And I, I, okay. And so Donna, do you think COVID is going to affect mystery authors and, our, and what we write about over the, over the near future? Yes, I do. I mean, I know uh, in the early days of the lockdown here in Toronto and in other places, um, at the time I was still recording the fourth, uh, the fourth season of Dead Rights. I think it was the fourth season, right, Dead? And uh, every author I talked to said the same thing. It hasn't affected their lifestyle because as writers, they're not in a crowded space anyway. They tend to be pretty much locked down by design. But it, uh, they were worried that it would affect what they wrote. And they didn't really know how to handle that because, you know, it was just too soon. It was too soon. It was one of those things. Yes. But now, I mean, we're what, eight, nine months into this? And how can it not? How can we have a lost year? How can it not affect our writing? And so in a way, it's kind of good that we've all kind of tackled it in our stories. Even the stories that don't involve COVID have a tinge of coronavirus to them. They really do. I know, like Kara, you know, picking up on the theme of what you were saying about the isolation and uh, the feeling of impending doom and all that, it all yeah, is exactly. something that, you know, that we, we write about anyway, but perhaps is enhanced, you know, over this time. What do you think? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I think so. I think it will, it'll change the art because the art always, and my husband is a, a, somebody who studied this, um, the art always follows society. What, what lasts is the art, not yes. the society. Um, but you can tell about the society from its art. And there is going to be a tailspin of darker stories, of uh, stories that even if they're comedic, they have an element of the profoundly dark um, there's going to be, how can there not be? At least that's my little humble prediction. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think it has kind of carried itself out with this group. So, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and now I want to talk to Rosalind Croucher, my sister. Rosalind, you gotta, yeah. Oh dear. Rosalind wrote a story titled The Drowning. And I think if I'm not mistaken, this is your first mystery story, isn't it? No, yeah, that's, that's right. My first mystery novel. I really liked it. I liked the way that you played with time in it 
And that's a really difficult element to, to conquer, um, moving back and forth in time and place. Um, uh, Madeline did it in a very different way. Yours was not a fantasy. It was supposed to be like a, a really could happen kind of story, but it moved from here to there in a, a really unique way. Um, what made you come up with that kind of time space movement? Uh, well, it all had to do with how the guy would be caught or not caught. So right. I had to go back and forth if I was going to tell his story from his side uh, and also then watch the police going through how they're going to try and catch the person. Yes. So I had to go back and forth through time that way. Yes. Yes. And there's a revenge element. I'm not going to ask you to reveal too much, but there's a really, really strong revenge element in this one. A lot of crime stories have revenge in them, but this one I would say is um, almost Voldemort worthy revenge um, in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the inner dialogue of your victim. And, Thank you. uh, you know, just just visualizing, you've got a really visual thing going on there. Um, for your very first story, you've really managed to work with the visual very well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I had to find some way of making you feel how it felt to be on the beach. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. You've got geography. You've got the East Coast where we came from. And uh, I think you're right there on the Bay of Fundy, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Super slow tide. Well done. So are you going to keep writing crime now that you've met a whole bunch of crime writers? I'm not sure. I mean, it depends what strikes me as being, you know, the best way to tell a particular story. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was the right way for that story. It really was. It worked out really well. Uh, Lisa DeNicolitz is next on the list. So I give you fair warning, Lisa. <laughs> Love thy neighbor. Speaking of revenge, <laughs> man alive, that's really something. So uh, you really, uh, you got just, your characters are glittering. They're oh. really, really too much. Honest to God, <laughs> just too much. What made you come up with this particular cast of characters? You know, I don't know where, can you hear me? Am I good? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. good, good. Um, I'm not sure where those particular characters came from. I was really worried that I wouldn't have a story to submit to the anthology because I really wanted to submit something. So working from home during COVID has had many challenges, as we all know. And the one for me is I'm very noise sensitive. Um, and the neighbors are very, very noisy. And so I was sitting at my desk and I was thinking to myself, I really want to write a story for this anthology. The neighbors are being so noisy, I can't think. And then I'm like, I'm going <laughs> to kill the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> and so you did. And so you did. I loved it. <laughs> it's called Love Thy Neighbor. And it, the first sentence of it is, Something along the lines of, well, not really. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's love thy neighbor. Yeah, not so much, but kill him. That came later. Look at that guy. I called out to my partner, Lori Ann, in the sunroom where I was designing a website for a pain in the Batinsky client. Talk about Mr. Clench. What's he got up his ass? Gold pebbles? She tut tutted me and I felt shame, but then she leaned her hand on my shoulder. Please don't tell me we're losing Arthur the good, she said. Oh, frack, look, a for sale sign. Sayonara, Arthur. Yes, and somehow, once I started writing it with Laurie Ann and Cindy Sue and then later Henry, the characters were so amazing. And so I took the, the situations like that are real. For example, the eternally cigar smoking neighbor and the fact that he conference calls right outside my window at maximum volume all day. He actually works for um, on the Ontario Union. So uh, I've learned a lot of interesting things about that because he really has no filter. He just yells at the top of his lungs. <laughs> so, but I took the, the reality where, you know, they're really kind of annoying people. And then these people came to me like Lori and Cindy Sue. And I don't know where they came from, but I love them to pieces. So thank you. That, that was such yeah. a gift. Well, you, Lisa, are kind of the quintessential really sweet looking lady and then we read you, you know? I mean, and god help us we read you, you 
<laughs> you have got some kind of twisted sense of revenge going on underneath all that. <laughs> it's really, really a great story. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. You're welcome. And uh, we've got one that I found really poignant called The Rocking R by John M. Floyd, who's in my top left corner. I don't know where he is for you, but John, I really loved your characters sitting there on their porch. I could see them. I felt like I knew them. I felt like I understood their troubles. And uh, how did you come up with that particular story? I don't know. I think I wanted to come up with uh, maybe a story about old people, which is probably appropriate. I know how old people think, right? And uh, these folks were set. This is uh, set in the South and I grew up here. And um, there's, a, there's a guy that's a retired farmer and his wife and they're, uh, they're sitting on, in the rocking chairs on their front porch, just kind of watching, watching the world go by. And they get, um, they get a phone call from uh, the county sheriff who is, who is uh, an old friend of theirs. And um, he says there been, there's been a, a robbery there in town at the bank. And um, it looks like the, uh, the robbers are headed in their direction. And so, you know, something's going to come of that because this is a mystery crime story and a mystery crime anthology, right? But um, the great fun of this, I think, of this story was the dialogue between the characters. I had a lot of fun with that. And then there's a, um, there's a twist, there's a plot reversal, a twist right at the end that um, I probably never grew up, but I just love that kind of thing. And uh, yeah. I hope yeah. readers um, Very hope open, might, right? might find that fun, you know. Very O. Henry, and you're right. The dialogue between these characters right there, that's the reason to read this story because these are real people, even though they're fictional. And uh, that's something that I always find irresistible in a story, real people saying real things to each other. And with that element of tenderness between them, you know, um, that's not even always expressed or spoken out loud, but you know, it's there, it's underlying the words. It's um, it, it really well done, John, really well. Thank you, I appreciate it, glad you liked it. Thanks, thanks, Donna. And uh, this is a very special guest. And normally we would be at Sleuth of Baker Street in our Halloween regalia with lots of wonderful food and lots of family and friends and celebrating the launch of great diagnosis. But these are very different times. And I'm so delighted that Marion could be with us today just to drop in to say hi and ma maintain part of the tradition. <laughs> Yeah, um, everything is great. The bookstore is great. Pixie's great. It's just such a shame we can't have the event at the bookstore because it, it's such a great fun time. And actually, I'm not actually at the bookstore at this moment. Um, JD's taken over so I could spend some time with you guys. Wonderful. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. And well, we were talking about that, how COVID has affected our writing, but also how, what are readers looking for like that's uh, now during these times, what, what do they want to read? You know, I, I was trying to, uh, it's hard to know what people want to read during a COVID time, but I honestly think our readers just want to keep on reading the people that they read so they feel comfortable they feel like it's a known, it's like drinking some tomato soup or having mashed potatoes. It's a comfort food. So, you, so it's a comfort book. They want a good read. They just yes. want to be taken yes. away to a different place. And oh dear, um, I think can, um, the, the other thing we have noticed, if, if you can hear me. Yes. It, okay, is that we've had a lot of new customers, which was a bit unusual and there's two things. One of them, one of the things are that they're saying um, they're not being able to spend their money on anything else. So let's buy books and spend money on books. Mm -hmm. And they're also trying to support all their local businesses. Yes. So it's been just, it's just been wonderful to have this new exposure. And we're getting people uh, sending us emails that we have no clue where, where they are or who they are yeah. um, at looking for books. So so we're very happy in a sense that um, in, in, in a sense, business has been good. 
Yes, and that's the Sleuth of Baker Street. I just uh, wish you, we could all be together. That's all. I do too. I do too. Can you give anybody here your your actual address so that they can Google you and get their butts down there? <laughs> uh, nine nine zero seven Millwood Road in Toronto, and the postal code is M four G like George one X two. And the, our website is um, sleuthofbakerstreet.ca. And we and do mail orders for anybody who might be out of town and would like to get a grave diagnosis, if I might just be so bold as to make a plug. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the plug. Absolutely. And uh, we wanted everybody to meet Marion because her store is really unique. We absolutely love it. I think it's been... Uh, since probably 2012, we've been doing group anthology launches at the Sleuth of Baker Street bookstore, and it's never disappointed. We've been having so much fun, and Marion is known among the crime writing industry in Canada as somebody who supports crime writers so much and really deserves our thanks. So thank you very much, Marion. You're welcome. And the one thing I'd like to say, which I always say, is that if it wasn't for writers and if it wasn't for the independent publishing companies like yourself donna um i would have to get a real job and i don't <laughs> want to do that so please everybody keep writing and donna please, please keep publishing oh i will i will thank you we okay. can't have that we can't have you having to get a real job no, no or my, <laughs> my or can you imagine jd getting a real job having oh, to get a real lord, job that, good lord that, more likely that would be even worse. <laughs> More likely you'd put uh, Pixie out to work. <laughs> well, she could probably generate a lot of money. Yeah. 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 I know Darcy wants a job, doesn't he, Alec? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to call on the next person on our list who is, is Mary Fraser in the house? Mary I Fraser. am. I am here. Hello, Donna. Hi, Mary. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks. Happy Halloween. <laughs> I know. Happy Halloween, everybody. Yeah. Uh, Mary wrote a story titled Aura, and we have a couple of stories, as you're all soon going to know, we have a couple of stories in this vein with a narrator that ropes you in bit by bit and um, is sad. I know there's some people who are, are reeling against unreliable narrators, but I find them fascinating. And uh, I know that a lot of the reading public does too. Can you tell us a little bit about how your character got to be so unreliable? Um, well, she gets migraines. And if anybody has ever had a migraine, you know how much they sort of turn your world upside down and how you think of the world and how you sort of think of other people in the world and the people that you love when your head doesn't hurt all of a sudden become incredibly awful when your head does hurt. And so I think she has trouble figuring out how the rest of the world is. So of course we have trouble figuring out her. It depends on whether or not she's in a good mood or whether she's got a migraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She, can't, she can't bridge the gap. No, I don't think she can. And she's had a lot of other terrible things happen to her and she's a teenager. So like, come on, teenagers are their own brand of Well, teenager unreliable. could be an illness in the medical uh, <laughs> journals. <laughs> Sorry if there's any teenagers in the house, but I'm betting there's a lot of parents of teenagers and, uh, <laughs> and aunts and uncles of teenagers and they can, they can, they can stand on their own as a crime wave. <laughs> That's and exactly now, it. Yeah, now I don't want you to give too much of the story away, but uh, tell us your character's name and what her situation living is. Um, well, uh, I don't think I named her. Um, I wondered. Yeah, I don't think I've named her. Um, I have a name for her, but her name, uh, her name is, so I'm going to tell you about my high school students because I teach high school. Okay. And one time, one of my students walked into my classroom looking for his little cousin. So he's a grade 12 boy coming into the classroom looking for his little cousin because he had seen her in the cafeteria with a boy. And that was unacceptable and he needed to have an intervention with her. And I just thought, okay, so this is a problem that you think you can control your, your little cousin and who she's interested in. 
And then I thought, okay, so how can I throw some more problems at these characters? How can I give them a really terrible past? And let's give mm -hmm. her some migraines while I'm at it. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On top of being a teen. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, it is a really, really, I, I, what's the word I'm looking for? I've already used, a, it's a taut story. It's very taut, very tense. Thank right you, through thank you. Through. Yeah, yeah. Now we've also got, what have we got here? We've got The Neighborhood Watch by Deli Fromm. And this one is a real kind of a, a true sleuth, amateur sleuth romp. So tell us a little bit about The Neighborhood Watch. The title kind of leads you into knowing that these are sleuth characters. These are amateur characters. And uh, I should mention that it's the first short story I've ever published. Oh, wow. Congratulations and thank yes. you. I wrote it during Melody Campbell's course on novel writing. So it's my very first story. So I'm absolutely delighted that you um, have published it. And so the inspiration of why it came about and why I thought about it, uh, we weren't into COVID lockdown. So it's not, although as I was writing it, we were. So it was the neighborhood became so prominent for me. The main character is modeled after my mother who lived from the age of 12 to 18 in Holland during the Nazi occupation. And she had a spidey sense, like the main character does in this, Mika, mm -hmm. so hence the Dutch name. But yes, exactly that, that she could see things about people that a lot of people were oblivious to. So mm -hmm. that's the same as my character. And it is a bit of a romp. I mean, she decides that this person who everyone else thinks is very good, you know, might be behind some, some shady stuff going on. And the biggest inspiration was actually the name of the anthology, A Grave Diagnosis. Okay. My mind immediately attached to what sort of uh, medical diagnoses have a statistically high probability of resulting in death, and thus would be a perfect cover for mm -hmm. murder. And so that's how it sort of gets into this whole thing with her spidey sense and uh, then looking into things and, and discovering things. And then once she has figured things out, then, you know, the game is afoot. She's going to find out. We a lot on that spidey sense, don't we? I mean, uh, even, even my character, who is a doctor, um, she had to rely on her spidey sense to some degree because who would have thought, you know? And it, I think maybe the, the situation that she found herself in heightened her spidey sense a little. But I think a lot of our writers, at least in this group, relied on spidey sense quite a bit, as well as clues. Um, and we've also got Boomtown Shakedown by Therese Greenwood. And this is another, I would call it a romp. This one is set in the, um, tell us where it's set. I'm gonna ask, call on you, Therese, I know you're here. Here I am. Oh, thank yes. you. Thanks so much, Donna. Yeah, I, I'm glad you think it's a romp. I've been, I've been calling it a postmodern feminist Western to myself. So. <laughs> I love it. And your final line, which I will not quote, lends itself very well to that description. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad you got that. That's what I, that's what I was going for. So uh, I, I started, well, I started the story. I was, I'm, I've been working for the past year on a biography for the University of, of, uh, Alberta with a residential school survivor. So it, it's an incredibly inspiring book, but, it, but it's very dark and it's, and it's very heavy. And so for this story, I wanted to do something fun and, and exactly what Marion was talking about, something comforting and you know something to kind of amuse myself. So I started a story about a dog named Jack, who is a chocolate lab, who is an absolute idiot, but you know, the sweetest dog ever. And right after I started writing Jack's story, I was evacuated from my home in Fort McMurray because we had a spring flood. So it's the middle of the pandemic and we're also all in, a, in evacuation shelters. And there's, oh, I think it was 6,000 people evacuated. And any of you who've been following Fort McMurray in the news, you know, we don't do anything small. Our last evacuation was 90,000 people. So this was during the fire. So this was, this was just a small one. But again, it was, you know, it was a kind of a bit much. So I decided that for this story, I was going to use my time machine and go back to the boom days in Fort McMurray, which loaned themselves. There's a lot of money floating around and just a lot of uh, just everywhere you looked, you could see you wouldn't if you if they could have paved the streets with gold, they would have done it. That's the kind of money that was floating around during the, during the oil boom. So I thought it was a much better setting to do a fun story. So I took the dog to the boom town and then I just let him be a beautiful idiot in the middle of, of all of this. You've got your beautiful idiot dog and you've got yeah. a cranky old man 
And you've got a young, sparky woman. I mean, you've got all the amazing, yeah, all. fantastic story. <laughs> Throw in a whole bunch of money, more money than yep. since. And you've got Boomtown Shakedown, I think. Yeah, I thought it might be, and a lot of people haven't been to a Boomtown, so I thought it might be a little bit of fun reading for people to sort of see all these kind of, it's really ordinary people in this like extraordinary kind of circumstances. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly a good description for it, Therese. Thank you very much. It was a great story. I really enjoyed it. Well, I'm glad you liked it. And thank you for inviting me to be in the anthology. It's my first time in a with the with the Mayhem group, and I've been really enjoying it. Really good. Ah, okay. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to be seeing a lot more stories from Therese Greenwood, for sure. We've also got a really unusual little one called A Pill a Day Keeps the Blues Away by Elizabeth Hosang. And this story involves medical workers. Tell us a little bit about it, Elizabeth. Uh, well, being a crime writer, I'm always looking for new ways to commit crimes. Um, in this case, it's a drug dealer. So what are ways that um, you know, will fly under the radar that you can get your product out? And I'd been talking to um, a good friend who's a medical worker about home care and uh, uh, what happens, how that works and the distribution of medical supplies. And this seemed like a good way to me to be moving product out in a way that the officials sort of wouldn't take notice of. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, you had a really clever cover for the crime, but you also had a couple of uh, irrepressible ladies at the front door and the back door who were kind of stopping crime. Yes, so the, um, well, the main character is a woman whose mother uh, is a police officer and has recently lost her foot due to um, an on the job incident and trying to care for a woman who is vibrant and outgoing and take charge and not used to being helped out at all uh, makes it very challenging for a caregiver to look after that sort of person. So when the, the mother becomes aware of something going on, it's, it's she doesn't just sit back and accept the fact that she's on medical leave. She's still a cop, she's still gonna do something about this. Yes, and she does it really well. Thank you. I enjoyed that one. And that one was called A Pill a Day Keeps the Blues Away. So look for that one. Next on the list, we've got Blair Keach, the irrepressible Blair Keach. <laughs> and what can I say about sleep per chance to die? It's just a wonderful story. It's really delightful. And uh, it's got all kinds of shades of maritime maritimism through and through. Yes, yes. Uh, so one of the uh, things, uh, and I wrote this story specifically for a grave diagnosis because uh, it really caught my imagination. So um, I sort of did two stories within the overall story that echoed within each, uh, within each other. And part of it is that I did want to do something involving a rare disease. So although I'm not a hypochondriac, I started to look into rare diseases and there's actually a rare disease day uh, end of uh, the last day of February of each year. And there's literally like 6,000 rare diseases that are known. And uh, I think I got the symptoms of every one of them as I was researching. <laughs> right. But I thought it would be intriguing if the main, one of the main characters has a rare disease, which is fatal, but someone is trying to kill him. So without giving too much away, why would someone be trying to kill the character when realistically they only have six or eight months to live? And that was sort of my springboard into all sorts of different, different scenarios within the story. And you brought along a romping dog too. And I'm not gonna to give too much away about Molly because uh, Molly is uh, humanizing, very humanizing yeah. to the story. Molly, Molly is a character in her own right. Yeah, and, and I've always been a, a big fan of pets and the role they play in our, our life. So th this was also, uh, to your point, a way of humanizing uh, the, you know, the narrator who is, who is actually not named, who's the detective that's, that's been hired to look into these murder attempts. Uh, but he has a, has a dog which sort of hopefully intertwines into the, into the mystery itself does it does very well it does it's almost like a little parallel story there is the exactly. story of molly and there is the story of now am i saying his name right loudon partridge yes yeah okay okay and he is uh he is a strange old dude 
So look for him in Sleep, Her Chance to Die. Yes. Apologies to Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and we have Laura Coleman, who writes Change of Heart. And Laura, I believe you're here. And Laura, Laura writes about um, immigrants for the most part. And you had a very unique, a very unique take on what could happen in a certain situation. So tell us, what was your inspiration for, uh, for the, this story? Uh, hello, I hope you all can hear me. Sometimes I have trouble with the microphone. Um, so the inspiration for the story was, um, it kind of started uh, with my work. So my day-to-day uh, -day job, the one that actually pays the bills, um, is uh, in science, in research. And I work with a technique that most, at one point, um, I saw people in the airport being screened uh, with this uh, instrument. And I thought, huh, I could write a story about narcotics and uh, ways to get um, interesting new drugs out on the street, just because I had a little extra knowledge on it. Uh, the inspiration for this particular story came actually when I was doing my research for um, a novel I finished writing, but I'm still editing, um, which follows a uh, narcotics detective and um, uh, searching to shut down um, a criminal gang that's trying to put out new drugs on the street. Um, and I kind of took one of the characters in the novel. Um, so the main character has, is a researcher, but she had a history working in police departments. And um, I give a little hint to what happened in the book, but I didn't actually want to spell it out because this came out before <laughs> there is even uh, the book is finished editing. Um, and um, she moved to Toronto. The story takes place in Toronto. Um, and uh, I started by looking uh, at an aspect that I hadn't incorporated enough of, I think, in my novel. And that was, um, what about the user community? Because we keep seeing stories from the perspective of either the drug dealers or the cops or maybe the families of the victims. But what about the user community? Um, and I was trying to read more about uh, addicted users and casual users. And that's how I got the inspiration for this story. This story actually centers around the community of voluntary users of psychotropic drugs, usually the ones that don't get addicted, uh, known as psychonauts. Um, and um, yeah, our main character who uh, had a history in uh, police uh, uh, enforcement is now trying to put that all behind, but she finds herself at a party when one, where one of the guests uh, passes out due to a, a um, stroke. And uh, unfortunately, they, when she's trying to help everybody get her to a hospital, they find a dead body in the backyard. And uh, it's, as, the, as they're trying to investigate it more and more, her background in narcotics investigation become, come, becomes useful mm. for her. And Laura, I thought that you did a really skillful job of, of using her dual backgrounds in law enforcement and, um, and her current job. You know, I thought that you went back and forth between bits of knowledge and you brought in relationships from her previous life too, which yes. was really useful in helping advance the story. I thought it was really well done and it brought just a kind of a sparkling different element of difference to the anthology. Um, it really, really nice. Well done. Thank you. We also have, I, I seem to be starting every sentence with album. I'm going to have to get my editor hat on. <laughs> but we also have the Crimson, the Crimson Grave by Haley Liversidge. And the Crimson Grave is a very unusual story. It starts out, um, it starts out in a graveyard. Let me ask uh, Haley. You're here, right, Haley? I think. Can oh, yeah. you tell us a little bit about this story without giving too much away? Um, well, the initial idea was, yeah, what happened if the sexton, the person whose job it was to look after a particular graveyard, because in the UK there are a lot of graveyards, particularly old ones, about, and people do look after them. It's their job. What happened if he found a body in a half dog grave? And so that was the start of the idea and the whole idea developed from that. 
and and basically with the idea of illness i thought right i want the uh, detective the di to be ill mm -hmm. and i also thought i want my main character the sexton who uh, discovers the body even though probably officially he would be a suspect having discovered the body i wanted him to take the prime place and be a bit of a rebel mm -hmm. as well because he wasn't necessarily following protocol no no there's a class element which is uniquely british in this story <laughs> and uh it, it uh <laughs> it comes through loud and clear and uh your main character is uh is as you say quite rebellious yes oh yeah he's been in the army some people in england would say he's well art <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's very good. And I'm not going to give too much away, but the victim in this one is an unknown character. So we don't know who the victim is. And this is a big part of the mystery. We must solve who is the victim and then we will know what the reason for her death was. And I loved your, your DI too. He was, he was very likable. Oh, well, that was part of it. I wanted him to be likable. And I also at the end wanted to add a, a note of hope. Yes, yes. I'm going to go from there to Sylvia Maltosh Warsh. So Sylvia, Sylvia has written Days Without Name. And I don't know how many of you have read Sylvia's work, but um, Sylvia's got a touch that is really unique. I was saying this to my husband this morning that um, it's really a very elegant story, Sylvia. I really want to thank you for sharing it with us in a grave diagnosis. Um, I, I just loved it. Can you tell us a little bit about your characters in it? I'm not sure why, but I've written at least four stories set in Central America, um, though I've never been there. So th that, um, that setting is actually a, a bit of a character itself. So this story is also set um, there at an archaeological site in Belize, which becomes almost a character with its uh, poisonous cane toads, and um, the ancient Mayan culture, which includes human sacrifice. So my protagonist is Lou, who's a grad student at the site, uh, who interrupted her studies when she got married. But the marriage doesn't go as planned, and she returns to Belize to pick up her old life, only to find a disturbing development there that changes everything. Um, so I did a lot of research for this story, and I made a lucky chance discovery about the Maya. They created a solar calendar of 18 months, but then they had five days left over. Uh, so they made those days uh, into a short month, uh, which usually comes up around spring, but um, the month was considered very unlucky. So it was a perfect time for me to set my story during that unlucky month. Mm -hmm. And the month is called? YM. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's and the month is a character. <laughs> In a sense, the month is a character. It's a, it, As with so many of your stories, it's so human. Like, I really felt that I knew these characters by the time. And, uh, you know, you have a very good, strong touch for being able to, to draw characters out. So Thank you. if anyone hasn't read Sylvia Maltash Warsh, you can get introduced to her in Days Without Name in a Grave Diagnosis. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> and, and our next story is uh, The Red Cord by Rob McCartney. And I know Rob is here. Um, Rob, I really liked The Red Cord. Again, it's not a real long one, but there's a relationship element in it that is really dear. Can you tell me what was your inspiration for this story? Um, well, the inspiration for the story was my mom, um, who suffers from dementia and is in long-term care. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously can't visit her right now because of COVID, but she's been in long-term care for a couple of years and just over the course of my visits and observing the relationship she has with my father um sort of the quirkiness about it and 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 the uh the, the limitations that she has um really really made me feel like i wanted to write something that that would instill a sense of pride and redemption in a, in a character like that and I also wanted to write something from the opposite point of view in terms of gender. I have uh, always been looking for a good story idea that I, where I can 
right from a first person uh, narrative of, of female voice and from that point of view. I think you did it really, really well. Um, the frustration of living with dementia came through in your female character. Um, you know, uh, just being at loose ends, but so did the care, the genuine care of the husband. Um, it yeah. was beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next one on our list is Hooked by Rosemary McCracken. And Hooked, as many of you know, drug addiction is an actual illness. And Rosemary decided to tackle drug addiction in her story. And you are going to love this one. It's called Hooked by Rosemary McCracken. And Rosemary, tell me a little bit about what made you come up with this story, please. Okay, around the time you announced the anthology, A, a Grave Diagnosis, I had watched uh, a documentary called Band of Brothers, uh, a documentary of Robbie Robertson and the band, the famous rock and roll band. And um, he talked a lot about it, 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 the, the reason the, the band uh, disbanded was the addiction. Uh, so he was spared... Uh, it, because he had two young children at the time and that they kind of kept him uh, and his wife uh, <laughs> out of drugs. But some of the other people were heavily into it. And it was, you know, and I start, started thinking about, you know, all the, 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 the groups that I loved when I was growing up and, you know, how they, um, uh, how drug abuse uh, uh, fractured careers and ended lives. People like uh, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, uh, Jerry Garcia, all those people. And it was, and, and, and Robbie said in the documentary that it was uh, an, an addiction. I mean, it was a, a disease and it could be cured and mm -hmm. treatable and cured. And indeed, the Canadian Medical Association calls addiction to drugs and alcohol a chronic and untreatable disease. Yes. So I... Um, uh, my story hooked is about a young woman who uh, falls in love with a major uh, rock star, and what happens? Her world changes. Her world mm -hmm. spins out of control. Yes, yes, yes. You did a beautiful job of drawing in music and the lifestyle and uh, the addiction and the actual trauma of your heroine, uh, what she was going through. And when you love someone who is addicted, the problem is just as bad as it is for the person who's addicted. Um, and this is what we don't often talk about. Talk about. In fact, there are a group, there's a group called Al-Anon. I don't know if everybody's aware of it. We've all heard of um, Alcoholics Anonymous but a lot of people don't know about Al-Anon, which caters to people who live with addicts. And um, it's a whole other kind of syndrome, just living with that addiction that other people have that impacts your life so profoundly. And you did a great job. And your heroine, I will leave with a note of hope, I think. Now she had to come by it in quite a dramatic way, but I think she did end on a hopeful sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink note. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's enough said, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Read the story and find out how this character finds hope in the situation she's in. Um, we've also got Woman Aglow by Lynn Murphy. You've got just a diabolical story about a woman who has a very rare condition and the condition is used against her. Can you tell us about it, how you came up with it? Because I know. Okay, well, I have my daughter Margot to thank for the story, uh, the idea for the story. She and I were in Panama just before the crisis hit. And um, one day she went back to the hotel room from the pool before I did. And when I came back, she was in a panic almost. And she said, I started, I was sitting on the balcony and I thought, what if the maid came in and locked the door to the balcony, not knowing I was out here and you didn't come back for hours from the pool and the sun came around on the balcony and I was fried. And I thought, what a good way to kill somebody. So <laughs> I, but I thought, but it's not quite enough to have sunstroke because I need a disease or a condition. And there is a condition called hypohydrosis where you cannot perspire. 
So you cannot cool your body if you get very heated. There's nothing you can do. So I gave my protagonist hypohydrosis. Yes, yes. And in effect, when somebody with that particular disease finds themselves in a very, very hot situation that they can't escape, they will almost literally boil to death. That's it. They, they get sunstroke. And if they're last long enough, they die. So yes. that's what I, that was my, I think I'm probably the only person in the book that used, has hypohydrosis as their medical condition. You are the only one. Yes, yes. And it made me look again. <laughs> It was really well done. I loved it. It's got Lynn's usual light touch, but it's a little more serious than, than many of your stories. It, it is quite dark. And there is, and there's also a witch in it, not a uh, evil witch. Or yeah, she is evil, but there's a witch in it for Halloween. So you have to read the story to find yes, out where uh, the witch yes, comes from. Find in. out who the witch is. Exactly, exactly. We have one called Napoleon's Nose by Joan O'Callaghan. And Joan opted to use a pet or a, a, an animal. And I, I, I shouldn't, uh, Joan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Tell us how your animal <laughs> fits into the whole illness. Well, uh, <laughs> Most people know that I really like to use animals when I'm writing. And in fact, last year at the Boney Blythe conference that we had, I chaired the panel on animals in crime stories and they can be used in a number of ways. But like many of the women who are here today, I am a breast cancer survivor and it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I read um, an article that animals like dogs and cats can smell disease. And in fact, in some cases, they are being trained to do that. They have very sensitive noses and they're able to um, sense when a person's body chemistry is out of whack. And I don't know that I wanna to say too much more. Exactly, exactly. Well, the cat is named Napoleon. Yes. And this is why we say Napoleon's nose. And uh, it's a really well done story. It's a very, uh, it takes some, um, some twisted turns, but there's also a little romance in it. And, and you kind of have not a real romance. It's just a hint of possible romance. Um, you, you kind <laughs> of do that with a lot of your stories too, don't you? Well, Donna, we're all human. Yeah. And I mean, what's life without a little romance, you know? Exactly, exactly. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> so look for Joan O'Callaghan, look for Napoleon's Nose, and thank you very much. It's a wonderful story, Joan. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Donna. I enjoyed um, all the stories. Yeah, yeah. Joan, uh, Joan and Madeline uh, have both helped an awful lot with this, and Joan has read through the stories as well as Rosemary. And Rosemary, you know from my heart, really. Um, uh, the next one up is Danny and Me by Ed Pivowarchuk. And if you don't know Ed, Ed is a phenomenal editor. He could not mm -hmm. edit a grave diagnosis because he had another large project underway and I can relate. And that's why Rosemary stepped in. But uh, Ed has contributed to a large number of our anthologies and it's always a delight to get his stories because he's got such a unique perspective. And Danny and me is the right. other unreliable narrator I was talking about. What made you come up with this particular story, Ed? Well, I, as, as you mentioned, the unreliable narrator, I was interested in doing a story featuring one. And then the other element of the you know, submission call was to have some kind of illness or disease feature and I think that I didn't want to approach COVID because A, it was, you know, around you all the time, you get tired of it, you know, and, and there's still, even now, we're still learning about it, so don't know very much about it. Mm -hmm. So I decided, well, um, I opted for my condition, disease, um, schizophrenia and the idea was that um, you can't it's difficult to distinguish if you have that condition or the people dealing with it what is real and what isn't mm -hmm. so that's, mm -hmm. um, exactly just because just because you suffer from paranoia doesn't mean they're not really out to get you <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and it's another one of those stories that you don't want to give too much away, but your character is a young, a young man. Um, yeah. At some points in the story, he's a, a child, but he does develop into a young man throughout the story. And uh, did you do much research for it, uh, for the condition? Um, I did a little bit of, I, I did some reading, you know, some reading up on you know, various Because one of the things I'd read about schizophrenia is that um, it presents at different times for men that it does for women. And you nailed the, the time frame for young men. Young men, schizophrenia starts to present quite young, whereas with women, it's often 29 to 30 in that time frame. Yeah. Another way in which uh, women we reach our prime later than men. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. I thought it was quite quite a diabolical, very dark, chilling, and really well told, as all your stories are really well told. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You so look for you. Danny and Me. It's got a beautiful light title, and it is not a light story. <laughs> We've got Criminals Like Us by Rosalind Place. And Rosalind, you've outdone yourself. This is such a wonderful story. But I'll tell you a little bit about this story because it's something I've noticed in Rosalind's work recently, over recent years, is that it's been going into the almost fantastical. And in this one, it, there's a futuristic element, but it's really, it's close to the topics we all know today. So tell us a little bit about Criminals Like Us. Okay, um, it's set in a possible future. And in this world, everyone lives in the cities and the cities are all locked down, uh, gated, gated. So people can't leave them. And the only people who are allowed to leave them are the people who work on these massive factory farms that surround the cities. And the main character is a young woman named Dee, who's um, rather a lost soul. And um, she, She's lost her family to a, um, a disease that's ravaged the population called Wilde's disease. And um, her mother was the last to die of this disease. And when her mother was dying, she started to tell her stories about a time when she herself had worked on these farms. And Dee becomes obsessed with the idea that she has to find out if her, the, the stories her mother told her when she was dying were actually true or not. And so the story opens with, um, D getting a ticket that will let her leave the city and she's going to go and find out what's out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Almost like there was a, a brave new world element to the opening, just the opening. Um, the story itself is very unique, so I'm not trying to lead anyone to think that it is like a brave new world. It's not. But just the opening where she has to kind of misrepresent herself in order to be able to go out to these farms. And she has got a goal. She's got a motive for wanting to be there. And what she discovers while she's there is the real mystery. So you've got to, you know, you've got to follow along with the story to find out. And I thought it was really well done, Rosalind. I was really impressed with it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for including it in our anthology. We're coming close to the end now. As you've noticed, we've hit the peas, right? <laughs> Next, we've got In His Element by Marilee Robert Robson. And uh, Marilee, what can you tell us about the reason you came up with this, the motivation for this story? Um, well, this, is, this story is um, an and a woman finds an elderly man who's lost. And um, this actually happened to me. Um, I, I, I don't know whether it's because I'm small or I look like I know what I'm doing, but people quite often approach me looking like tourists, looking for directions. Um, and in this case, I was in the historical vision of Steve's village of Steveston, um, which has replicas of shipbuilding and old houses. And um, I was reading a plaque and this older man came up to me and said, can you help me? Um, I think I'm lost. Um, which sort of, I had to try and track him down. Unfortunately, he did have some ID and we phoned some people and um, got him, got somebody to come and get him. But um, 
I started wondering about if it hadn't been summertime, if it had been winter, and what if there'd been a blizzard so that people couldn't come and get them. Um, and so the protagonist is confronted with a story of, of finding an elderly man with dementia and trying to help him. Mm -hmm. And um, um, and then there's art theft and various other misdemeanors as well. Yeah. Yes, and there's dementia again. And I think that a lot of us in this particular generation have had to deal with family members who've suffered dementia. And uh, so you've got a, a, you've got a very loving touch to your, your character with dementia. Um, you know, you treat him very well with an awful lot of dignity and uh, draw out who he is and how he came to be and try to get him into safe hands. Um, really well done. And I think it's a story that people can relate to. And next on the list, we have The House of Elizabeth Dandridge. And that is by C.A. Rowland, Carolyn. Don't forget to unmute Carolyn. This is a really wonderful story. It's in the Gothic, um, in the Gothic genre almost, um, I would say. Uh, would you agree? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you like to read Gothic mysteries, you're going to enjoy this story very much. Um, a woman's husband has bought a house and we're clearly in a time and place where men feel that they should be making decisions for women. And here is how it goes in the house of Elizabeth Dandridge. What inspired you to write this story? Um, back a couple of years ago when we could actually travel, um, I have a group of writer friends and we try to find really interesting kind of writing retreats. And we ended up going to Transylvania for a horror writing workshop. And in that um, course of working on stories there and visiting the castles and seeing Dracula's castle and everything that was around there in Transylvania, um, it started to come to me of, you know, houses have personalities that reflect their owners. Mm -hmm. um, and then thinking about the picture of Dorian Gray, where the picture took on some of his attributes. Yes. I thought about what if it was a house that had a real personality and let's move it into the fifties and in a, sur in a uh, sort of a suburban neighborhood in the Southern part of the U S and let's see what mm -hmm. happens when the couple that you described move in. Yes. Yes. And who were their predecessors? And I'm not going to ask you to reveal who their predecessors were because therein lies the story. But um, it's not just that, though. There's another story going on, too. There's a story about a woman who's coming into her own right slowly and uh, trying to make some decisions for herself. And uh, she loves her husband very much, but she doesn't want to be an accessory. No, and it's it is sort of that struggle of women. Mm -hmm. uh, back at back in the 50s and the 60s and when you're a housewife and what makes you valuable and were your opinions taken or your suggestions I mean it's a different struggle than what we have today yes. but it's still a struggle that I think that women and, and readers can identify with yes um, that was going on back then Yes, yes. And I liked that. Uh, I'm going to throw out one teaser um, without saying too much. I like that your bad guy was a woman. That he's what? That your bad guy was a woman. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, women can be bad guys too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> made it fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, we're going to move on to Cross Match by Madonna Scaff. And uh, this is a wonderful story. Um, Somebody is looking for a match. If you're not familiar with the phrase cross match, somebody is looking for a medical match. Tell us what inspired this story, Madonna. Well, it's sort of, it's kind of a long story of how it got inspired. Because when I first heard your, uh, the call for submissions come out, I was thinking, oh, I, I just can't come up with anything. Because, well, first of all, uh, I write a novel series uh, where my main character has MS. And so there's, there's that series. And uh, then there was an anthology that came up just last year where the characters were all disabled. And it's, uh, it's called Nothing Without Us. And so, and, you know, and the editor asked me to come up with something for that. I couldn't come up with anything. And then I finally, I did like almost the last minute. And 
So in this case too, same thing. Couldn't come up with anything. I can't do a character with MS. That's like redoing it all over. And you know, I'm a disabled character. And then I started, oh yeah, I was sitting on the deck during the pandemic in a heat wave. For some strange reason, I thought about my, uh, my sister-in-law. They live up in Sudbury. They'd come down to see the skating and uh, the skating, uh, like the competitions. And she was coming down, she works as a nurse. And she was coming down with one of her patients that's on kidney dialysis. So she brought her down. And I'm thinking, well, that was really sweet. I thought, wait a minute, kidney dialysis? Well, you know, and there's, she's a nurse. And then they had to do cross-matching of blood types and all these things. So my brain started swirling. And that's how the story came about. And I, I created this character, Detective Biggs, who is, uh, he juggles kidney dialysis and fighting crime. Then he's given a like a new partner, a little female partner who she's very young and eager. And at first to keep her out of his way, just tells her, just go find a cold case to work. And mm -hmm. eventually he realizes that they're, they make a good team, but, yeah. and he's very happy. But then all of a sudden he discovers that the cold case that uh, she found was one that he'd tucked away in the back drawer of his desk. Mm -hmm. One that he hoped nobody would ever find it would always remain forgotten. So that's mm -hmm. basically, I don't know how this all happened in a heat wave, but. Well, you came up with some really good characters. I loved the, the team that you built. And uh, they were very sympathetic characters and you just wanted, the, you wanted it to work out. You really wanted it to work out. So well done, thank you. Well, thank you. And we've got Waiting in the Wings by Caro Souls. And Caro, this is just a beautiful story. I was telling Alec um, this morning that this one is, uh, I don't read a lot of fantasy but I really fell in love with Marlo. Well done. Um, I'm so glad that you lent him to our anthology. Can you tell us a little bit about Waiting in the Wings? Caro has just recently released Marlo's Dance, featuring the same really effervescent character, Marlo. So what was, uh, what was your inspiration for Waiting in the Wings? When you announced what this was about, I thought that this would be a good time to introduce Marlow because the book hadn't come out, of course. And he was the first um, a cop, I suppose, on Merculean. This is my Merculean series and it's number four in the series, but each of the books is separate. That doesn't really matter. And I, but I thought this is the first time I've actually written a mystery on this planet that I write about so much with all these fun loving hermaphrodites are having such a fun time. And so it was interesting to develop the idea of how on earth would you have a police force on this kind of a planet where they're very laid back and they're, um, they don't have much murder or, but they have other kinds of crimes, which are, and we don't have to go into that. So then I thought, um, what kind of illness would they have here? Because they're supposed to be, one thing they're good at is curing things and you know fixing people up who are sick, uh, other Mercurians that is. But then I figured that the, the, the person who is uh, the one who eventually who has an illness is also a hypochondriac. And that's the problem. If he just left things alone, mm -hmm. This might not have, he would not have opened the door to being bumped off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, incidentally, I like this character so much. He was a stage director because a lot of my characters are in the arts. I liked him so much that he's now in the book that I'm working on now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, thought, I can't, I've resurrected him, even though, never mind, nobody will know he's dead except the people who read the book, the story. So I resurrected him and he's in the, the, the new book that I'm working on now, the new Merculean book. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, Marlo is just a wonderful character. I mean, he, he's, uh, he's Hercule Poirot, if Hercule Poirot was off world, you know? I mean, I, I just really liked him. Oh, well, thank you. He doesn't have Hercule Poirot's uh, sense of style, unfortunately. He's usually, no. he's, he's no. quite careless about things and he's always spelling things. and. You know, his so maybe belt. we can maybe we can cross him with Colombo. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's closer to Colombo as far as the looks go, I suppose. But um, and he, he's a bit too, you know, portly and all that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. uh, he is fun because he's um, 
you know, if the way he looks at the world is interesting, I think. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And your crime was quite, uh, and, and the way that your, your side characters dealt with the crime was quite something too. It's a really unusual approach to relationships and you can get away with it because you're off world, you know? Yeah, that's true, that's yeah. true. Yeah. We've got a really, truly beautiful story called Medicine by Vanessa Westerman. And in, um, in medicine, I'm put in mind of something we've been watching recently called, and my husband won't let me say dirty words, so I'm going to call it Skits Creek. <laughs> I'm blaming him. No, no, he doesn't tell me what I can say. Please believe me. <laughs> I see Kathy laughing because I know Kathy's been watching this one too. But uh, Vanessa's story features an actress and how she loves her character with a love that is deeper than her own life. And uh, I'm making a little light of it by comparing it to, to Skits Creek, but the reason I compare it is because of course the Moira character, as funny and as absurd as she is, she loves her characters so much too. But Vanessa's story is really poignant. It's a truly profound story about that kind of love for your art. Um, what made you write this story, Vanessa? What was the inspiration behind it? Well, first off, thank you so much. Um, when you told us the topic of the anthology, uh, my first thought was medical drama television series for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why my first thought was that, but I was thinking a bit about all of these streaming platforms and how there's such increased viewer demands on what exactly people want to watch and how the characters are developed. So that's how I started playing with this idea of an aging actress who loves her character, her role that she's devoted her life to with such a passion. Um, the character is called Dr. Gray Steele, and she has developed a mysterious illness on the show because the director wants to replace her with an easier to please starlet. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about if suffering sells, how can a heroine maintain her strength and how might she retaliate and take her revenge? And you did it beautifully. It, it uh, absolutely, you could feel what that woman was going through, the inevitability of obsolescence yes. and how it's really not fair. Uh, men, listen up. For women, we don't reach that golden gray area where we are suddenly respected and revered and where people know that we suddenly know what we're talking about because we've got experience. No, because just when we start to feel we're approaching that, we're growing our gray beards, suddenly we're obsolete. We're no longer welcome on set, you know? Exactly. And, uh, uh, this is this is a really good story. I think everybody's really going to enjoy it. And I think we're going to close with Blake because I think he's back. Do you have sound now, Blake? Blake's got some very interesting characters. I'm going to tell a little bit about, about um, the poison pill cure. When you read it, you want to look for the playoff between the daughter and the father. That's a really good uh, relationship right there. Um, an interesting relationship. Also, the characters in a rooming house, a student's rooming house. Um, it's not really a dorm, but it's on campus. It's a rooming house. And all of the characters are potential suspects in a poisoning. And just like in one of our earlier stories we talked about, the character is going to die anyway. So there's a big question about why do we want to kill him? And uh, when you find out why, then you know who. And that's all I'm going to tell you because you have to read The Poison Pill Cure to figure it out. And really delightful characters, Blake. I enjoyed them very much. Thank you. And I know you've got no sound, but thanks for the thumbs up. I appreciate it. <laughs> and we've been through all of our authors and I had hoped to go through them all twice but I don't think we're going to be able to because our answers, I knew it would happen. They took a little longer than we hoped. But can we take another few minutes, maybe five, ten minutes, and see if any of our audience has any questions for any of our authors? Uh, one of the things I would say is hi. Say, say hi to Lady. Oh, here. there's Lady. Hello, Lady. Good to see you. Hey, lady. But the other lady thing, is one of our three. The thing I would say about <laughs> this is it's fascinating to hear everybody's voice. Yeah. It's not yes. the same. You concentrate on people's voices, and quite a number of you have lovely reading voices. Yes. I would just like to add that. Yes, that's very true. 
That's very true. One of the things I find as a, an indie publisher is when I read the work and then get to hear the author's voice, there's often a pretty strong connection. There's often. Um, and yes, Kathy, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I mean, when I read your stories, I could just be sitting down having a cup of coffee with you or, you know, something stronger, maybe, but let's not admit that. <laughs> you know, I mean. It's very true. And uh, so many of our authors have got a, a, a sort of an undertone of lyricism. And I know that Rosemary and Ed have come across this too, working with authors. Um, there's an undertone of that frustrated poet almost. And Caro comes to mind and Sylvia comes to mind. And um, then there's like a, just a, a love of research. And, uh, you know, it, for that, I look at uh, Joan. There's always something that I didn't know when I read it. And uh, there's like that frustrated character under everything and that's Lisa. <laughs> I made you laugh. <laughs> Good. All of our authors, I mean, I appreciate you all so much. Melody, you always, you always make me smile. Always, no matter how grim things seem. I wanna thank each and every one of you. If we have any questions, here's the last chance. If we don't. Yes, Donna. Yes. So sorry to bother you. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. One was for me. Uh, there were questions about where to order the book in print or if there is an electronic version. There um, will be both a print and an electronic. We have been hit by Murphy's Law 2020 edition. It is not ready yet. You are not blind. You are not mistaken. Um, but I have put a challenge out. The first person who sees the selling page over the next couple days for a grave diagnosis on Amazon, contact me at carrickpublishing at rogers.com. And the first three people to contact me to say the selling page is live will receive a free copy of World Enough and Crime, our last Carrick Crime anthology. So we'll try and have some fun with the fact that for the very first time in my publishing life, I am delayed. So... There we go. Donna, <laughs> Donna, can I say something? It's yes, Rosemary. Certainly. I just, I just want to thank you, first of all, for today. It went really well, and it was lovely to hear the real voices of all these authors. But I also want to thank you for your months and months, not to mention years, of supporting all of us in your yes. work and in your enthusiasm. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Rosemary. I love working with you. I love working with you. Um, Rosemary has got a beautiful series of, uh, of crime novels, but also poetry. I mean, Strong, Certain, and Alone is just a wonderful book of poems. If you have a little bit of a, a, little bit of a more um, esoteric outlook sometimes, please look for that book. Also, The Midnight Boat to Palermo on top of Rosemary's mystery series. So all of our authors are just so sparkling and talented and it's my honor to work with every one of you. It really is. Rosemary said it so much better than I, I could. And I just wanted to say a huge thank you, Donna. I know how overwhelming this job has been. Plus you're working full time, plus you have a family, plus you have other projects, plus you have dead to rights. I don't know how you do it. You are the most organized and proficient people I've ever met. And I wanted to say a huge thank you for this anthology, which gives us all a voice. Oh, well, thank you very much, Madeline. Thanks to each and every one of you for joining us today, for your patience sticking it out yes. so long. And a big thank you to Ted for being the wonderful tech guru behind yes. all this. Yes, and for the music, which is going to follow us out. Thank you all so much. I'm going to end the meeting now, and uh, it's been wonderful seeing you all. Dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the year.
years have turned my eyes gold And I told you what you told me We'd never be in the same boat for free Yet it rides Let it ride